Chapter 6. Breakfast with Disaster Lena's first morning in the doctor's house did not go well. Poppy was still sleeping when she awakened, and so was Mrs. Murdo, so she got up quietly, put on the same prickerstuck clothes she'd been wearing the day before, and went down the stairs. The doctor was standing by the table in what must have been her nightgown, a patched brown sack that hung to her knees. The hair at the back of her head was sticking up. She was leafing through a big book that lay on the table. Oh, said the doctor, seeing Lena. You're up. I was just looking for... I was trying to find... Uh... Oh, well, I suppose it's time for breakfast. The doctor's kitchen looked like a complete mess to Lena. In Ember, the kitchens had been spare, stocked with only what was needed. Some shelves, an electric stove, a refrigerator. But in Dr. Hester's kitchen, there were a thousand things. Wide wooden counters ran along two sides, and on the counters was a jumble of jugs and pans and tubs and pitchers, big spoons and knives and scoops, and jars and bottles full of things that looked like pebbles and brown powder and tiny white teeth. There were baskets piled with vegetables Lena had never seen before. In the corner squatted a bulging black iron box. She thought it might be a cabinet, since there was a door in its front. "'We'll see if we have any eggs this morning,' said Dr. Hester. "'That would be a start.' Torrin appeared suddenly from the other room. "'Eggs!' he cried. "'I want one!' "'Eggs?' Lena didn't know what that meant. She followed the doctor and Torrin through a door that led outside. Beyond the door was a place like an open-air version of the ember greenhouses, only the plants growing here were far bigger and wilder, curling and twining and shooting upward with tremendous energy. Lena recognized some of them. Bean vines climbed up frames of netting. Tomato vines grew on wooden towers. Charred and kale plants spurted up like big green fountains. In among the rows of plants, some fat, fluffed-up, two-legged creatures of the kind she'd seen on her way into town yesterday waddled along, poking at the ground with a sharp thing like a tooth that stuck out from their faces. "'What are those?' asked Lena. "'Chickens,' said the doctor. "'We'll check their nests and see if they've left us anything.' She bent down and went through the door of a wooden hut in the back of the garden, and when she came out, she had spiderwebs in her hair and a white ball in her hand. Not a round ball, but one that looked as if it had been stretched sideways. "'Just one today,' she said. "'I want it!' cried Torin. "'No,' said the doctor. "'You've had plenty of eggs. This one is for our guests.' She handed the egg to Lena, who took it gingerly. It was smooth and warm. She had no idea what it was. It felt more like a stone than food. Was it some sort of large bean, or a fruit with a hard white peel? Thank you, she said doubtfully. See, she doesn't even want it, Torrin said. She doesn't even know what it is. He gave her a hard shove, making her stagger sideways. Quit that, cried Lena. You almost pushed me over. Torrin, said the doctor, stretching out a hand, but Torrin ignored her. I'll push you again he said, and he did, harder. Lena stumbled backward and caught herself just in time to keep from falling into the cabbage bed. She felt a flash of fury. She raised her arm and threw the egg at Torin, and it hit him on the shoulder. But instead of bouncing off, it broke open, and a slimy yellow mess dripped down his shirt. Now look what you've done! Torin screamed. It's ruined! He put his head down as if to run at Lena and butt her, but the doctor grabbed his arm. Stop this, she said. Lena was horrified, disgusted, too. That yellow goop was something people ate. She was glad she didn't have to, but she felt stupid for what she'd done. I'm sorry I wrecked the egg, she said. I didn't know what it was. You wrecked my shirt, too, shouted Torin, wriggling in the doctor's grasp. But you pushed me, Lena said. Well, yes said the doctor in a weary voice. That's how it goes, doesn't it? Someone pushes, someone pushes back. Pretty soon everything's ruined. Everything, said Lena. But can't his shirt be washed? 
Oh, yes, of course, the doctor said. I didn't mean that. Never mind. She let go of Torin. I guess we'll have bread and apricots for breakfast. Mrs. Murdo had come downstairs now, leaving the still-sleeving Poppy in bed. They all had breakfast together. Lena ate five apricots. She loved them for their taste and for the feel of them, too. Their rosy orange skins were velvety, like a baby's cheek. She also liked the bread, which was toasted and crunchy, and the jam, which was dark purple and sweet. Mrs. Murdo kept saying, "'My, this is tasty,' and asking questions about what bread was made of, and what a blackberry looked like, and why apricots had a sort of wooden rock in the middle. Dr. Hester seemed a bit flummoxed by these questions, but she did her best to explain. She was nice, Lena decided, but distracted. Her mind seemed to be elsewhere. She didn't notice that Torin was putting all his apricot pits into his pocket, for instance. Or maybe she didn't care. When breakfast was over, Torin went up to the loft and came back down carrying a bulging bag. These are my things, he said loudly. I don't want anyone touching them. He knelt down and opened the doors of the cabinet under the window seat and thrust the bag inside. Casper gave them to me, and anyone who touches them gets in big trouble. He closed the cabinet doors and glared at Lena. What an awful boy, Lena thought. How could nice Dr. Hester have such a horrid son? Lena had thought she'd go back to the plaza and find Dune right after breakfast, but she changed her mind when she went upstairs to waken her little sister. Poppy seemed so sick that Lena was frightened. She didn't want to leave her. She brought her downstairs, and all that morning Poppy lay on the couch, sometimes sleeping, sometimes wailing, sometimes just lying much too still with her mouth open and her breath coming in short gasps. Lena and Mrs. Murdo sat on either side of her, putting cool cloths on her forehead and trying to get her to drink the water and medicine the doctor provided. "'I don't know what's causing this child's fever,' the doctor said. "'All I can do is try to bring it down.' After all the walking of the days before, Lena was glad to sit still. She settled into a corner of the couch, her legs tucked under her, and watched the doctor dither about. She seemed to have a hundred things to do, and a hundred things on her mind. She'd stand for a second, staring into the air, murmuring to herself, Now, all right, first I must look up, uh... and then dart over to her enormous book and shuffle through its pages. After a second or two, she'd suddenly set the book down and hurry off to the kitchen, where she would take a bottle of liquid or jar of powder down from a shelf and measure some of it into a pot or she'd dash out to the garden and come back with an armload of onions, or she'd vanish out the back door and appear again with a sheaf of dried stems or leaves. It was hard to tell what she was doing, or if she was really accomplishing anything at all. Every now and then she would come back to Poppy and spoon some medicine into her mouth or put a cold, damp cloth on her forehead. "'What is that enormous book?' Lena asked her. "'Oh,' said the doctor. She always seemed a little startled to be spoken to. Well, it's about medicine. A lot of it is useless, though. She picked up the book from the floor and riffled its pages. You look up infection, and it says, prescribe antibiotics. What are antibiotics? Or you look up fever, and it says, give aspirin. Aspirin is some kind of painkiller, I think, but we don't have it. We had aspirin in Ember said Mrs. Murdo, rather proudly, although I believe it had nearly run out by the end. Is that so? said the doctor. Well, what we have is plants, herbs, roots, funguses, that sort of thing. I have a couple of old books that tell about which ones to use. Sometimes they work, sometimes they don't. She ran a hand through her short, wiry hair, making it poke out on one side. So much to know, she said, and so much to do. Her voice trailed off. I suppose your son is a help to you, said Mrs. Murdo. My son? The boy, Torin. Oh, said Dr. Hester. He's not my son. He's not? said Lena. No, no, the doctor said. Torin and his brother, Casper... They're my sister's boys. 
They live with me because their parents were killed in an avalanche years ago. They were in the mountains on an ice-gathering trip. And the boy has no other relatives? asked Mrs. Murdo. He has an uncle, said the doctor. But the uncle didn't want the trouble of bringing up the boys. He offered to have this house built for me if I'd take them on. The doctor shrugged. So I did. What is an avalanche? Lena asked. What are mountains? Lena, said Mrs. Murdo, it's not polite to ask too many questions. I don't mind, the doctor said. I forgot that you wouldn't know these things. You really live it underground. Yes, said Lena. Dr. Hester scrunched her gray eyebrows together. But why would there be a city underground? Lena said she didn't know. All she knew was what was in the notebook she and Dune had found on their way out. It was a journal kept by one of the first inhabitants of Ember, who told of the fifty couples brought in from the outside world, each with two babies to raise in the underground city. They thought there was some danger, Lena said. They made Ember as a place to keep people safe. It was that long ago, then, said the doctor, before the disaster. I don't know, said Lena. I guess so. What disaster? The disaster that just about wiped out the human race, said Dr. Hester. I'll tell you about it sometime, but not right now. I have to go and see DeBert Webb's infected finger. Can I ask one more question? said Lena. The doctor nodded. Why is this place called Sparks? Oh, said the doctor, smiling a little. It was the people of the last truck who gave it that name. Our twenty-two founders. They were among a very few people who survived the disaster. For a while they found food by driving around from one place to another in the old towns, using cars and trucks that still had a sort of energy-making stuff called gasoline. Gas, for short. Cars and trucks? thought Lena. Gasoline? But she didn't want to interrupt, so she didn't ask. When the food and gas began to run out, the doctor went on, they decided it was time to start a life somewhere else. They found one last truck that still had gas, and they loaded it up with supplies. Food and cans and boxes, tools, clothes and blankets, seeds, and everything useful they could find. Then they drove east, out across the empty lands, staying close to the river. Right here, the truck broke down. When they opened the hood, a great spray of sparks shot up out of the engine. So they decided to settle in this spot, and they named it Sparks. The doctor stood up and looked around for her medicine bag. It turned out to be a fitting name in another way, she said. Sparks are a beginning. We are the beginning of something here, or trying to be, the way a spark is the beginning of a fire. But fires are terrible, said Lena. Terrible or wonderful, said the doctor, who had found her bag behind a chair and was heading out the door. They can go either way. Lena never did go down to the plaza that day. She didn't think Dune would worry. He knew Poppy was sick, and he'd figure out that Lena had stayed with her. She would go and look for him tomorrow, she decided, and find out then what was happening to the people of Ember. Late in the afternoon, Lena went outside and sat on a rickety bench in the courtyard of the doctor's house, waiting to see if anyone was going to make dinner. It seemed unlikely. The doctor was off treating someone's toothache, and Mrs. Murdo was up in the loft with Poppy, who had started crying an hour ago and still had not stopped. A door opened and Torin came outside. He sauntered over to Lena and stood in front of her. "'Your sister is probably going to die,' he said. Lena jerked back. "'She is not!' Torin shrugged. "'Looks like it to me,' he said. "'Looks to me like she is the plague.' He sat down on a wooden chair, where he could stare straight into Lena's face. He was wearing a sort of undershirt. It was white and looked like a sack with holes for neck and arms, and his thin legs stuck out from baggy shorts of the same material. 
He had combed his hair so that it stood up like a tuft of grass at the top of his forehead, making his long, narrow face look even longer. "'I don't know what you're talking about,' Lena said. "'You don't know about the three plagues?' said Torn in a tone of exaggerated surprise. "'Or the four wars? You've never heard of the disaster?' "'I've heard of it,' said Lena. "'But I don't know what it is. I don't know about anything here.' "'Well, then, I'll tell you.' he said. You can't go around being so ignorant. She said nothing. She didn't like this boy's superior attitude, but she wanted to know everything there was to know. She would let him tell her, but she wasn't going to ask him to. It was a long time ago, he said. He spoke in a precise, teacherly voice. There were millions of people in the world then. They were all geniuses. They could make their voices travel around the world, and they could see people who were miles away. They could fly. He paused, waiting, no doubt, for Lena to be amazed. She was amazed, but she wasn't going to show it. Besides, he was probably lying. She just nodded. They could make music come down out of the air. They had thousands of smooth roads and could go anywhere they wanted really fast. They had pictures that moved. He waited again. He took a few apricot pits from his pocket and rattled them idly in the palm of his hand. All right, she would ask. What do you mean, pictures that moved? Didn't think you'd know that one, Torin said with a tight little smile. They were huge pictures, taller than a house. They were called movies. You'd look at a wall and see a story happening on it with voices and other sounds. How do you know all this? asked Lena. She thought he might be easily making it up. We learn it in school, said Torin. They teach us a lot about the old times, so we won't forget. Have you seen a moving picture, then? Of course not, he said. You have to have electricity, and there hasn't been any for a long time. He chucked one of the pits at a bird that was about to drink from the water dish. The splash scared it away. We had electricity, Lena said, glad to score a point over him. We had it in ember until it ran out. We had street lights and lamps in our houses and electric stoves in the kitchen. For a moment, Torin looked dismayed. But did you have movies? he said. Lena shook her head. Anyway, she said, what does all this have to do with my sister? I'm about to tell you if you just let me. The important tone came back into his voice. So there were all these billions of people, but there got to be too many of them. They messed up the world. That was why the three plagues came. But before the three plagues, they had the four wars. Once again, he paused and looked at her in that infuriating way, lifting his thin eyebrows. Just tell me, she said. Don't look at me like that. You don't know about the four wars? No. War? What's that? A war is when a bunch of people fights with another bunch, when both of them want the same thing. Like, for instance, if there's some good land and two groups of people want to live there. Why can't they both live there? They don't want to live there together, he said, as if this were a stupid question. Also, you could have a war because of revenge. Say one group of people does something bad to another group, like steal their chickens. Then the first group does something bad back in revenge. That could start a war. The two groups would try to kill each other, and the ones who killed the most would win. They'd kill each other over chickens? That's just an example. In the four wars, they were fighting over bigger things, like who should get some big chunk of land, or whether you should believe in this god or that god, or who got to have the gold and the oil. All of this was enormously confusing to Lena. She didn't know the meaning of god or gold, and she wasn't sure what he meant by oil. You mean she said, thinking of the jars that had once been stocked in the storerooms of Ember. The kind of oil you cook with? Torin rolled his eyes. You really don't know anything, he said. He flung the rest of the pits he was holding at the three little red-headed birds pecking at the weeds between the bricks, and the birds scattered, cheeping. This was really beautiful, valuable oil. Everyone wanted it. And there wasn't enough of it to go around, so they fought over it. They hit each other? Much worse than that, said Torin. 
He leaned forward, elbows on his knees, and in a low, husky voice told Lena about the weapons they had had in those days. The guns that let you kill people without even getting near them, and the bombs that could flatten and burn whole cities at once. They set the cities on fire all over the world, Torrin said. His small eyes glittered. And afterward came the plagues. I don't know what a plague is, Lena said. A sickness, said Torin, the kind where one person catches it from another person, and it spreads around fast before you can stop it. We had one of those, Lena said, the coughing sickness. It would come sometimes and kill a lot of people and then go away again. We had three, said Torin, as if three plagues were better than one. There was the one where you wither away, like you're starving to death, the one where you feel like you're on fire and you die of heat, and the one where you suddenly can't breathe. No one knew where they came from. They just rose up and swept over the whole world like a wind. Lena shuddered. She was tired all at once of listening to Torin, who took such pleasure in describing horrors and saying words she didn't understand. So, Torin said, the four wars and the three plagues. Those together were the disaster. When it finally got over with, hardly any people were left. And that's why we had to start all over again. He stood up and brushed away a twig that was clinging to his shorts. We don't have war anymore, he said. Our leaders say we must never have war again. And besides, there's no one to fight against. But if we ever do have to have one, we'll win. Because we have the terrible weapon. The terrible weapon? said Lena. What's that? But just then, Mrs. Murdo came out the door with Poppy in her arms. Lena jumped up and ran over to her. Is she better? She's a little better. Poppy lay against Mrs. Murdo's shoulder, her head turned sideways, her eyes dull. Lena? She said in a small voice. Lena ruffled her fine brown hair. Torin cast an indifferent glance at Mrs. Murdo and walked away across the courtyard. The gate clattered behind him. Poppy doesn't have a plague, does she? Lena said. A plague? Certainly not, said Mrs. Murdo. Whatever gave you that idea? That boy, said Lena. That horrible boy. 